As I mentioned, this dialogue series is all about exploring the critical role of women in transforming Canada's energy systems to net zero. We've been hearing a lot about net zero these days, especially with the United Nations Climate Change Conference or COP26 meeting that was held in Glasgow at the beginning of this month. Leaders convened from all over the world at this 26th UN Conference of the Parties, and there was considerable momentum behind ensuring that gender equality and the role of women and girls in climate policy and action is recognized and celebrated. It's important to note that the impacts of a change in climate often disproportionately affect women and girls. According to a UNFCCC study, 80% of people displaced by climate change are women and children. We were thrilled to see the Government of Canada's commitment to target a significant portion of its climate finance pledge towards gender equality outcomes. With all this in mind, Globe Series and the Pemina Institute have partnered on this project because our two organizations share the belief that gender equity and inclusion has the potential to be a powerful and unifying force for a more inclusive climate and energy future in Canada and around the world. I'm thrilled to share we had over 200 people register for this virtual dialogue, of which almost 90% identify as women. And today we have attendees joining us from all over Canada, the US, and even further abroad, including the United Kingdom, Malaysia, Germany, India, and more. The first Women in Energy Transformation Dialogue, which we held on September 29th, set the stage for the series by featuring the stories and experiences of four incredible women who are each playing a different role in Canada's energy transformation. Today at our second dialogue, we'll be exploring key themes surrounding gender equity and inclusion in the energy sector, including those that emerged at COP26. And we'll take a deep dive into five key barriers that women in the energy sector face on a day-to-day -day basis. We'll do this by first hearing from Patricia, Patricia Fuller, Canada's ambassador for climate change, who's fresh from attending COP26 in Glasgow, and we'll share some of her learnings and perspectives from that experience. From there, we'll give a brief overview of the five barriers we'll be exploring, and then we'll hear from five amazing women who have agreed to share some of their own experiences and stories related to these barriers. Finally, and this is the really exciting part, we'll be diving into breakout rooms um, where we'll have a chance to explore those five barriers and hear from you, uh, your perspectives uh, in those spaces. And most importantly, we'll start considering some of the solutions to overcoming these barriers. Your contributions uh, throughout this, uh, this, these breakout rooms uh, are going to help shape our next dialogue, uh, which will be held at the Women's Lunch at Globe Forum. We'll dig into those key solution pathways that will enable women to play a critical role in the energy transformation that we need. Globe and Pemina have enjoyed the opportunity to work together on this series. We've remind, and we've been reminded over and over again that working together is going to be the best way to create the energy system of the future. So we encourage you to lean into this conversation, engage actively through the chat, share your thoughts, learn from the stories and successes, and support one another's experiences, both the good and the bad. We're keen to hear your views and thoughts. We only ask that you share them respect, respectfully and take some time to listen. Be open to all opinions, views, and experiences that might be shared. Okay, with all of that said, it's time to get things started. And so it's now my pleasure to introduce to the virtual stage, Nicole Vidori, Vice President and Head of Environment at TD Canada. TD is the newest addition to this wonderful group of, of sponsors we have supporting this dialogue, which also includes Capital Power, Synovus, Natural Resources Canada, OPG, and Enbridge. You'll have a chance to hear from more of our sponsors when we move to the breakout rooms. But now, Nicole, over to you to kick things off for us. Thanks, Elizabeth. It's my pleasure to be here today with you. I'm Nicole Vidori, Head of Environment for TD Bank Group. And we have an exciting discussion today on women in the energy sector. And we're joined by some phenomenal leaders that I'm excited personally to hear from. This type of dialogue is really important to TD. We have committed to net zero emissions by 2050. And this includes aligning our investment and our, our lending portfolios to 1.5 degrees. We recognize that this is an incredibly complex task and we know it's going to require strong leadership, 
collaboration in diversity of thought in order to achieve an inclusive and equitable transition. And that's why we're proud to be supporters of the Pembina Institute and GLOBE series, who we know share the same vision for a just transition and who are working hard to increase growth and capacity in the energy sector as we pursue decarbonization efforts. Now I'm thrilled to welcome Patricia Fuller, Canada's Ambassador for Climate Change, who we heard recently attended COP26. Some of her accountabilities include providing advice on climate change considerations in Canada's international priorities, leading bilateral engagements with partner countries on clean growth and climate change, and representing Canada in international climate change initiatives, just to name a few. Ms. Fuller has also served abroad as Ambassador of Canada to Uruguay and Chile, among pre previous assignments in Latin America. Please welcome to the virtual stage, Patricia. Thanks so much, Nicole. And uh, Patricia, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. How are you? Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm doing well. Excellent. Patricia, I want to dive right in. Um, you know better than most uh, that achieving our climate goals is a huge challenge, and it's going to require a pretty serious shakeup of how we do things. Um, but shakeups like this also provide an incredible opportunity for broader um, positive transformational change. I'm wondering if you can just talk about that a little bit from, from the lens of COP26 and, and what opportunities, uh, you know, in terms of meeting our climate goals also represents for, for gender equity and diversity. Sure, Elizabeth, pleased to. I, I think the key message here is that in transformation, there is opportunity and there's opportunity for advancing gender equality. Addressing climate change requires us to make significant transformations across our economies and, and around the world. And so uh, what I see is uh, in those transformations, uh, in many cases, women taking leadership positions and that's, that's really gratifying to see. And, and in the corridors of, of COP, uh, you know, I was uh, looking uh, this morning actually at a, a, a photo essay of some of those tense last moments at, at, at COP. And I do you know, have to recognize that there were a lot of men in those photos and some of the photos have only men in them. But uh, there were some very strong uh, voices that I would say were advancing that shakeup and, and that contributed to that outcome at COP where uh, uh, we did make progress and we did uh, uh, come out with commitments that, that will require uh, uh, countries to accelerate their ambition and, and that help uh, all of the uh, uh, observers and, and civil society to hold our feet to the fire. So, you know, I would single out in that respect, um, the prime minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, uh, and her, her minister uh, of economy who was there until the bitter end as well. Uh, um, also uh, Tina Stedge from the Marshall Islands, who you may have seen on the big screen in those last critical moments. Um, so those were voices that were, were really important. And, and uh, in the international discussions around gender uh, that I've been part of throughout my mandate as climate ambassador, um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard the phrase, women are more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And it's absolutely true. But what I, I heard at COP, the phrase that I uh, really stayed with me was, uh, we are fighting, not drowning. <laughs> and that, that was, you know, that was on gender equality day. And that was, that was the point that I guess I've seen on the ground in, in many countries. Uh, for example, uh, in the work on the Global Commission on Adaptation, where you, you and I uh, first met uh, as, as part of that, the commissioners traveled to, uh, to Bangladesh to meet with local communities. And and you know what we saw is communities are confronting flooding. They're putting in place 
new ways to address that. And women are taking leadership positions in those new structures, things as simple as putting into place uh, savings mechanisms for, for those days when disaster hits. So simple things like organizing that everyone contributes a cup of rice every day to build up a store of food for the community. Or another example uh, in, in the sort of opposite context of drought in Peru, where um, I've seen as they look at how to restore traditional methods of, of retaining water in the Andes, uh, new governance structures, new kind of forums coming together to, to discuss with, with the water utilities as to how this is gonna work. And in those new forums, women emerging as leaders. So I think, you know, those are the kinds of examples where we have to do things in different ways. And as we figure out how to do that, uh, there's opportunities for, for women to take, uh, to take up leadership opportunities. And I, and I am encouraged by uh, seeing that happen both in the, the international halls of uh, COP and things like that, and, and on the ground uh, uh, locally where, where, uh, where people are confronting climate change. Absolutely. I mean, we do see, you know, the, the statistics around um, women, children being among the more vulnerable, but we're also absolutely seeing uh, women and girls being among the most vocal and those leading, um, uh, leading the charge in terms of action. Um, and, uh, and it's incredible to see. Um, and you know, when we talk about these these kinds of shakeups, we see this change occurring. You know, sometimes this kind of transformational change, <clears throat> pardon me, can be a challenge for incumbents, for those that have been uh, leading the charge, uh, let's say in the past or in uh, for previous um, generations. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that that this is the case, and in, in both the case of climate change and and gender equity, that um, these shakeups are challenging for incumbents to wrap their wrap their minds around. In some cases, I mean, are, are there experiences that you could share um, from your career and specifically from the recent COP in this regard? Like, what do we do to 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 get past this uh, incumbent challenge? Yes, I, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's that kind of, um, I guess some uh, um, industries or communities feeling threatened by this transformation that we're talking about. And, and I think, you know, that can and has led to climate change being a, a, a divisive issue. Uh, but I think the, the, the key point to recognize is that to meet this challenge, the transformation uh, of our economy has to be across all sectors and all, all industries. And uh, so it's not as if there is, you know, green industries and, and industries that uh, won't be part of this change. Like take, take for example, again, looking at uh, what happened in Glasgow, uh, there were, were, were uh, um, a series of what were called the Glasgow breakthroughs statements, countries co coalescing around certain goals in certain industries. One of those is steel. So, you know, we may, when you think about clean tech, you might not think about the steel industry, but of course, to meet our climate goals, the steel industry will, will have to achieve net zero emissions by, by 2050. So uh, equally, when we look in the, in the energy industry, we see companies that are reinventing themselves as energy companies. It's not about where that energy comes from. It's, it's about the need for energy and how we provide energy in a clean way. So I think, you know, when we start to think of it that way, that everyone needs to be part of this change, it, it does, um, it, it, it does help us to get past the, the challenges of, uh, of uh, uh, incumbency, uh, if you will. And, and, you know, I think same for gender equality, like it's, you know, for sure, there's opportunities for women to take up leadership positions, but women, men, people of all uh, uh, backgrounds, ethnicities, uh, uh, and diverse views have to be part of this chain change, we have to all come together uh, around this. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think working collaboratively and, uh, you know, we've seen this even in, in our experience at Globe, the opportunity to partner with, with different and, and new uh, potential collaborators, absolutely critical to success. Um, but that collaboration, you know, it can be a challenge in and of itself. We've seen that firsthand through, through COP negotiations. You know, it's tough to, to arrive at those agreements. Um, but we do, of course, we hear over and over again, uh, it's critical, critical and, and ultimately of course, the, the hard work enables us to achieve greater ambition. You know, can you share some of the examples uh, from your time uh, at COP26 and, and around these negotiating spaces where you've, you've seen that hold true, both in terms of our climate ambition, but as well as our goals for, for increased um, gender equity and inclusion, where that hard work in terms of the collaboration, you know, really pays off? Yes, I think you know the 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 uh, the, the uh, my takeaway on this point is that you uh, uh, you work with the people that you can move forward with, right? You know that's the that's really uh, the the magic of collaboration is is uh, whether it's countries or companies or different kinds of groups that have a higher level of ambition that come together around a commitment and then build that coalition out. And, and I think uh, that's, uh, if we think about the COP context, yes, there are the things that the almost 200 countries have to agree on and <laughs> that's incredibly difficult, that consensus process. But there's a whole lot of other things coming out of the COP that are essentially coalitions of the willing. And, and we saw, so many of those at COP, perhaps too many, somewhat assert, because it became it became honestly overwhelming on, you know, the coalition of this, the alliance for that, the statement on this coming out uh, every day. But it's positive in the sense that that there, are, that those are 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 coalitions and alliances of of groups that are setting higher levels of ambition. And the important thing is to grow those. So. So let's take the example of, of the Powering Past Coal Alliance that, that Canada started uh, a short four years ago with about 25 members. And, and now it's got 165 members and, and it's you know, sharing experience among companies and governments about how to do this transition. These are kind of like mutual support uh, uh, organizations. So it's, you know, it's not just about setting that level of ambition, but it's about helping each other to get there. And that's what the Powering Past Coal Alliance is doing with, with members like uh, Capital Power that is part of this conversation today, you know, as they look at how they're figuring out how to, how to transition coal plants to gas and thinking about how that, that could move to hydrogen in, in, in the future. Sharing that kind of thinking and strategizing with other companies around the world is invaluable to meeting our goals. And, and around, around gender, uh, let's take the example of, of Equal by 30, which, which uh, is an initiative that, that Canada launched uh, uh, with with Sweden uh, at the Clean Energy Ministerial three years ago, and uh, it's also grown to something like 170 members or so. Uh, companies, uh, governments, again, like Powering Past Coal, and and what is it doing? Well, it, it's it's asking members to set goals around equality by 2030, whether in leadership or in opportunities or in pay in their organizations. For example, in a company that, that chooses metrics and sets a goal for 2030, and then supporting each other to, to meet those goals. And, and we've grown that coalition in the G7 uh, under the UK leadership, G7 members, uh, all members of Equal by 30, uh, uh, um, committed to a, a, a higher set of principles around uh, uh, equality. And this is specific to the energy sector. The Equal by 30 is, is specific to the energy sector. So I think very relevant for the, the discussion today. I know Globe has also been involved with it. And, and I really encourage uh, participants in the session today, you know, if your organization is not already a, a part of Equal by 30 to, uh, to take a look at that and, and consider joining because I think it's these types of uh, collaborations around specific goals and helping each other to figure out how to get there uh, is, is uh, so much part of uh, how we move forward. Absolutely. 
Patricia, it's been such a pleasure to spend a few minutes with you today. Um, we've got a, a diversity of, of incredible women. I know, on, you know, on the line today, um, we've seen people using virtual to come back and 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 watch watch videos and and dig into content that's now available to them online. Um, you've had a long career in this space. You've been a champion of of climate issues for Canada, of of gender equity issues. What what message of of hope or inspiration would you would you leave with with the the women and 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 girls um, that might be watching today and and that really want to make a difference uh, in this energy transformation? Oh, I, I would just say I, you know I've seen so much hope in the in the young women that I have a chance and privilege to meet with, uh, including at COP, such inspiring groups of, of of young women who are going to contribute to this transformation in in so many different ways. So I would just say uh, we have a huge challenge before us as a global community, and uh, you go get them. <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> world is your oyster there's so much work to do that that you can find your you can find your place and and make a difference fantastic patricia thank you so much i wish we could spend uh, all day chatting together um but we've got a great lineup of speakers and of course we're going to be digging in with the participants so thank you so much uh for being here today and uh and have a great a great rest of your day thanks again thank you Elizabeth. great to see you take care you too um Fantastic. What a great way to kick things off for our session today. Um, it's my pleasure now to invite to the screen uh, Binu Jayakumar, who is going to be um, kicking off the next uh, segment of our, uh, our, of our session. So Binu, welcome and uh, over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. And uh, thank you, Patricia, for that inspirational global perspective. Um, hey folks, it's a pleasure to be joining you today. I'm speaking to you from Treaty 7 territory in Calgary. It is also where nations of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Stony Nakoda First Nation, and Sutina Nation have long gathered. And this is home to Region 3 of the Métis Nation of Alberta. Now, I lead the clean energy work at the Pemina Institute. Uh, we're a nonprofit think tank working to support a clean energy transition in Canada in an equitable manner. And we do it through research, projects with stakeholders, and convening efforts like this one, all with the aim of creating practical and hopefully durable policy solutions. Now, while our work is driven by the urgency of climate change, we're guided by our core values of equity, curiosity, evidence-based thinking, and practicality. And to Ambassador Fuller's point, uh, Pemina has also joined the Equal by 30 uh, initiative. And this is how we're stri striving to bring all these values to our work in women in energy transformation as well. And I'm proud to say that the first substantive piece of work we have done in this field was released just about a month ago. And maybe folks have seen this report, it was on the barriers to women's participation in Alberta's energy transition. And we'd like to use our findings to provide a bit of a framework for the rest of today's discussion. I have to say here, we owe a debt of gratitude to the several experts and organizations that have been working on women's issues for decades. We relied on their knowledge and input as we examined the underrepresentation of women in both traditional as well as emerging energy sectors. And we found five key barriers that show up along all points of the career journey for women in the energy sector, all the way from student to CEO. And as we all know, these barriers are rooted in cultural and social norms, and also in the lingering structural issues from an industry that was basically built to support full-time male workers with stay-at-home female workers. And as we know, these hurdles then discourage women from joining the energy industry, disempower them from their roles, and make it very challenging for them to advance. We hope to build on the understanding of these barriers to explore some promising solutions that can make sure that we don't carry over the current inequities into the emerging next uh, economy that we are building. Uh, we'll get into more of that in the breakout sessions. So no spoilers, uh, but first let's take a deeper dive into the barriers themselves. I'm very honored to be supported in this by some really incredible women leaders who will be sharing their own stories around each barrier. 
So we'll start with the lack of access to opportunity. Uh, we know that women don't have the same access to information and opportunities as men do in the energy industry. It's an industry that has predominantly male networks, whether it is email chains or happy hour networking. And these are the spaces where a lot of opportunities are offered and exchanged. I actually had to learn to golf just so I could hang out with my supervisors where I, when I was at an oil and gas company. And so I could be part of conversations of the future of a project I was working on. Um, and women and girls are also less likely to enroll in science and technology programs than men. For example, in 2018, women accounted for less than 20% of the enrollments in engineering programs. But it's these very same STEM degrees that are actually needed for the women to get a foot in the door into many of the jobs in industry. Uh, to talk about more of her experience in this, I invite Dr. Bipasha Barua to the screen. Dr. Barua? I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. So I'm going to try and make this relatively brief and hopefully the rest can emerge in discussion. I'm a professor at the University of Western Ontario, where I hold the Canada Research Chair in Global Women's Issues. And in the past 10 years, I've studied the challenges and opportunities women face in the energy sector in OECD countries like Canada, as well as in emerging economies and developing countries around the world. I've carried out global surveys on the status of women in the energy sector for intergovernmental organizations such as the International Energy Agency and the International Renewable Energy Agency. I've also conducted hundreds of interviews with women and men at various career stages in both the traditional fossil fuel based industry as well as the renewable and green energy sector in order to understand the challenges and opportunities that women face in the energy sector. I try to understand careers in the energy sector along three dimensions. So number one is recruitment, number two is retention, and finally promotion, number three is promotion, advancement, and leadership. Of course, some barriers and opportunities encountered by women transcend these categories. There's no question mm -hmm. about it. So recommendations to improve recruitment, for example, may have positive effects upon retention and advancement as well. I also think it's really important to remember that the line between what constitutes a barrier and what constitutes an opportunity can be quite dynamic because some barriers can potentially become opportunities with appropriate employer support, with appropriate policy inputs, with shifts in social attitudes, and with broader economic, environmental, and political changes. So I'll very briefly share a few details about one challenge for recruitment in the energy sector, which is the lack of adequate information and awareness about careers in energy. One very clear finding from my research is that careers in the energy sector are generally not in introduced tools through formal channels such as career frequently. Dr. Barua, you're cutting in and out a little bit. Could you try that again, please? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So women working in the oil and gas sector have emphasized to me repeatedly that they had never been informed about careers in this field in high school or even in the early years of university or college. A phrase that has been repeated very often to me over the years is that women tend to stumble into, I've heard this many times, stumble into the energy sector. Although significant effort has been made in recent years by educational institutions, human resource organizations, industry associations, and gender equality advocacy groups to increase awareness among girls and young women about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math, so STEM fields, they remain quite disadvantaged compared to young men and boys. Because these sectors were almost exclusively dominated by men for so long, much information about job opportunities, as well as information about skill transferability, appears to continue to travel through what I would consider familial, as well as professional networks that are still predominantly male. So young women, men will often tend to get job opportunities in these fields through things like family connections, through peer networks, and through student associations. 
women usually do not have commensurate networks and connections. Even when they have male family members working in these sectors, I found that career information is rarely shared with women and girls. Of course, there's nothing wrong with career information being passed through familial or other informal networks. Having a parent or a, another family member in an occupation can be an advantage for both women and men seeking a similar career. And certain women may also benefit from such family connections. However, for those women and men without such networks or unable to benefit from them, even if they exist, there is a really urgent need to level the playing field by mainstreaming. By that, I mean by improving equity in access to employment opportunities and information. So the need for more institutionalized information systems about employment in the energy sector has been emphasized in various contexts in North America and Europe. And I agree that it is, it is one of the critical gaps in terms of gender equality, why we see way fewer women and girls in this industry. So I'll stop right there and allow the rest to emerge in questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barua. That was a great overview and particularly stressing the importance of different information channels. Uh, for our next challenge, we'll take a look at uh, the access to good jobs. So, Dr. Barua had mentioned recruitment, and the, there's a question of what is a good job? And for women, often they need to take into account many different considerations when making this definition, um, particularly due to cultural norms and expectations. Women often have domestic and social responsibilities that they need to balance with work. So many women prefer jobs that have flexible hours and a consistent location. These constraints are then further exacerbated when combined with the lack of access to affordable childcare. And all of these challenges together can lead to women ending up in positions that many wouldn't actually consider good jobs because they lack some pretty critical aspects, you know, things like opportunities for advancement, health benefits, social security. I have to say here, we do have some good news on this front. Uh, last week, Alberta became the latest of the provinces to enter into the $10 daycare deal with the feds. Uh, but obviously, a lot more remains to be done. And to explore some of that, I invite Deanna Burgart to the screen here. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, good morning, Tansi. My name is Deanna Burgart. I'm coming to you from Treaty 7 territory. Uh, I live and work in Calgary. I'm from Treaty 8. Uh, my, my relatives are from Fort Chippewan and Fond du Lac First Nation. Um, I am an engineer and I self-identify as an indigenous. I'm a faculty member at the University of Calgary, um, but I'm also very involved externally in terms of um, energy transitions. I'm actually here in Banff right now at the Energy Futures Lab um, in-person workshop for the first time in two years, which is very exciting. And um, I, I thought about this question um, quite a bit. Thank you so much for, for having me here today. And I apologize, I won't be able to be in the breakout rooms because I do um, have to get back to the Energy Futures Lab, which is <laughs> really, really cool because we're talking about very much the same sort of topics in terms of access and transition. And, and one of the things that came to me as I was thinking about this was, you know, what is a good job? Like define good, because that, that definition is shifting globally. Mm -hmm. It used to be, can we get the can we get the salary that we got in oil and gas? Like I spent 20 years in oil and gas. Um, in sustainability roles, compliance. I started out the first 10 years in upstream. The next 10 years was focused in midstream and pipeline engineering and sustainability and uh, permitting and social license. Um, and interestingly enough, as we talk about, well, you know, if we want to transition our career, what does that look like? And what I had to do was in 2016, I left my management role in the industry, resigned, started a consultancy called Indigenous Engineering Inclusion and prayed that somebody would be interested in my vision. And now, five years later, I am a faculty member at the University of Calgary and teaching chair focused on weaving Indigenous perspectives into engineering. And I teach a brand new course on um, uh, introduction to environmental engineering and sustainable development and energy. And what I'm seeing with my students is 
they, they, they have different values. A good job means something very different today and not just for women, but for, for new generations coming up, which are things that I wanted as a single mom, like 20 plus years ago, when back in that time, when you graduated and went into a technical job in oil and gas, it was tough to get a job in the Calgary office. You had to be willing to go work remotely in the field for two years. And I was a single mom of a toddler. I couldn't do that. Um, so the, when you think about barriers, there's everything from the jobs themselves, the roles and responsibilities. Um, today, I have a disability. And so, you know, if, if somebody said to me, no, I'm sorry, you got to spend two years in in work, work boots mm -hmm. in, the, in the field, trekking up and down, um, you know, stairways. I, I couldn't do it. So that could be a barrier. And for me, that's where it comes down to. And I love this new acronym, well, relatively new acronym. We all hear about equity, diversity, and inclusion. Lately, I've heard equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, but recently, I heard justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which the acronym makes JEDI, which uh, the Star Wars nerd that I am, I'm like, use the force, people, use the force. So really, this, this uh, for me, the conversation about lack of good jobs was really, we need to redefine what a good job means first. And that's you know, the job itself, what are the roles and responsibilities? What are the expectations? What's the timeline? Am I traveling? Am I at home? Can I work with childcare hours? But also salary, you know, we need to change that, that paradigm that success means I need to get that six figure salary right away. We're all in a transition and, and we're figuring out what that looks like. Um, the culture, the culture of the organization. One of my most sobering quotes that I've ever heard is the culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leaders are willing to tolerate. And wow, when I first heard that quote and thought about the past 25 years in you know, engineering and oil and gas, that was really eye-opening for me and made me passionate about culture, culture shifts. And finally, what are our purpose? And, and one of the barriers was mentioned earlier is that connections piece. So all I can say before I wrap up is I, I love that we are having these conversations more and more. And please feel free to reach out to me. I apologize. I can't stay for the entire session. I can't wait to watch the recording. Um, I'm here at the Energy Futures Lab with Alison Thompson from the Canadian geothermal energy industry. And she was just saying in our introductions that she's looking for later career folks that are wanting to tr transition into um, you know, the future of energy. And, and Liam Hildebrand with Iron and Earth who's working with indigenous folks and um, oil and gas workers that wanna transition. So this, let's make those connections and, and be those connections for each other. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Deanna, for that really inspiring wrap up um, and putting that nuance to that definition of good jobs around practicalities and values. I think your Jedi uh, framework is really resonating with the people in the chat if you look at their comments there. Um, thank you. Um, moving on, the next challenge we wanted to dive into a little bit is the inability to advance. Um, now, this has been documented really well, you know, as seniority level increases, the number of women decreases. In the oil and gas sector worldwide, women hold only 17% of the leadership positions. And we know these are based on several biases that may be held against women based on stereotypical domestic and social responsibilities. And again, the informal male dominated networks that our speakers have spoken about too are often where these advancement opportunities are presented. Uh, to speak a little bit more to this, I'll invite Anna Stukas to the screen here. Hi, Anna. Hi, and, and thank you. And wow, Deanna, you are a tough act to follow. <laughs> my goodness. Uh, my name is Anna Stukas. I am a Vice President of Business Development at Carbon Engineering. We are a Canadian clean energy company working to commercialize technology to capture carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere, at which point it can either be put back underground where it came from or combined with clean hydrogen to make low carbon fuels and products. 
In addition, I am a past president of the Society for Canadian Women in Science and Technology and a firm believer that diversity is an absolutely critical component of innovation. Across Canada, women are underrepresented in decision-making roles. This disparity is even more pronounced in the energy industry, where overall underrepresentation of women contributes to an exaggerated disparity in leadership. But it doesn't have to be this way. For example, the company I currently work for has gender parity at the C level and the VP level and near parity at the director and management levels as well. We've hired the best people for the jobs. They've happened to be women. Our team brings a diversity of backgrounds and perspectives and it contributes to our ability to innovate. A common example cited in the research is the impact and potential negative consequences that parental leave can have on a woman's career development. By pure chance, I am the only woman at my current company who has taken maternity leave while working here, and I've done it twice. By contrast, we've also had multiple men take parental leave. As an organization, we have made a conscious choice to support all types of family and parental leave, but not all organizations do. Because the company that I work for has made this choice, I have been empowered to craft maternity leaves that not only worked for my company, but also worked for me, that have allowed me to stay engaged, to return early because I wanted to, maternity leave is not one of my core skills, and to have the flexibility that I have needed both to constructively contribute and to spend the time that I've needed and wanted with my babies. Because the company that I work for has made this choice, other mothers have been able to do the same because their partners who work for us have also been supported to take leaves that work for their families. But we still have more to do. Canada's parental leave structures are run through our employment insurance system, which is not designed to allow for flexibility or variations in how you take your parental leave. For example, while the system provides provisions for parents' salaries to be topped up on leave without impacting your benefits, many companies, particularly startups, are simply not in a position to do so. Furthermore, if you're actually paid for doing any useful work while on parental leave, aside from the incredibly valuable and useful work of raising your children, but if you're actually paid for work, your EI benefits will actually be clawed back. And they will be clawed back dollar for dollar for anything you earn on maternity leave, which is those first 13 weeks of leave that are exclusively reserved for birth mothers, and then clawed back at 50 cents on the dollar for anything you earn while on parental leave, which is the remaining portion of leave that can be divided between either parent in any combination. Furthermore, because our system which is amazing in enabling you the flexibility to take 12 or 18 months of parental leave, there's often an assumption that you will take that much leave, whether or not that actually works for you. A consequence of this assumption is that there's a dearth of options for childcare for very young children, which can lead to parents who might otherwise have preferred a more flexible approach to maternity leave or parental leave to not being able to take it. So I'm going to leave you with two calls to action. First of all, to companies, to make a conscious choice to support all parents to take the parental leave that they need to support their families so that we can make this a shared responsibility rather than something that falls solely on women's shoulders. And to our government, to modernize our parental leave structure to make it work for parents and to allow the flexibility that we need in order to enable women to continue to advance in the ways that they desire. And with that, I'll turn it back to Benu and I really look forward to the breakout sessions and discussions. Thanks, Anna. Those are some really crunchy pieces of advice for us. Um, 
for our next challenge, I actually don't need to make much of an intro. I think we've all experienced uh, income inequities at many different levels. And so I'll just go ahead and invite Mariam Monsef to speak to income inequities in the industry. Merci, Benu. Bonjour, Anin. Salam alaikum. Uh, I'll use my time to focus on three areas. First, gratitude, and that's the place where we build on progress. Second, on the GBA plus and the work ahead. And third, I don't think it would be a climate event without a note of caution or a warning. Uh, so I'll get into it. First of all, many thanks. Merci beaucoup, Pemina um, Globe Series, for votre travail acharné, for votre leadership. Thank you for convening us, for including me, and to the badass women on this call. This has been one of the most stimulating uh, Zooms I've been on in a while. Um, I want to thank those women who didn't drown, who kept swimming, who kept fighting against all odds, and brought us to this moment in time where you know, congratulations because of you, those who've come before you, you've made the case that there is a link between a healthy environment and a healthy economy. Climate change and climate action elections. You saw Canada leading at COP uh, this past year, and of course in Paris with Catherine McKenna, representing Canada at the time. At the speech from the throne yesterday, you heard very clearly the government of Canada's commitment to continue to grow the economy and fight climate change and create good jobs in the process. You also made the case for applying an intersectional feminist lens to this work. As billions of dollars are invested, it's important to recognize that, you know, the, the consequences of climate change will, of course, as Oxfam shown in their reports, that they will most severely harm those already most vulnerable, including women, indigenous folks, racialized folks, those with disabilities and exceptionalities. So moving forward, the work ahead isn't about making the case that climate change is real or that we got to step up. That case has been made and no credible leader is going to debate that again. The work ahead is about showing how and doing some hand holding as we've heard speakers on this call say. Every single GBA plus we did and I'm grateful to see ASPA from my department, my former department, Women and Gender Equality on this call, every single GBA plus that we did on this file consistently showed the same thing that women are hardest hit by the consequences of climate change, that without high-speed internet, that transformation wouldn't happen. So we invested billions in addressing that. Every single GBA plus said that the rates of gender-based violence on work sites in workplaces are a key barrier to women moving forward and moving up. And there is a commitment as you heard in the speech from the throne yesterday to a 10-year GBV plan and the Department of Natural Resources working specifically with the sector to address that. Every single GBA plus we did showed that without universal child care, women are not going to be included in these jobs and they are not going to move up if they are included. And every single GBA plus that we did said the same thing. The jobs that are going to be created to mitigate, to adapt, to do anything around climate financing are going to disproportionately benefit men because of the underrepresentation of women in STEAM. So the work ahead isn't about making the case anymore, it's about how. How do we increase the participation of women in science, trade, technology, engineering, arts, and math in the next three to five years? Could we increase the participation of women in each of those fields by 100,000 a year? Yes, we can. And I know we can because we have done it. I'll give you an example. Rhonda Barnett. Mariam, uh, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. I'm just watching the time here. I was wondering if you can bring some of these examples to our breakout sessions. They're exactly designed to move on to the how, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, Absolutely. And my caution would be this, Bino. If we yeah. don't do this, we further exacerbate the income gap. 
we further exacerbate the income gap and Canada loses the ability to lead internationally. And if we don't, this progress isn't carved in stone. We run the list, risk of losing the progress if women like Catherine McKenna, if women like Kim Rudd and others aren't represented in politics. Thanks for that note, Mariam. Yeah, for sure. It looks like there's a lot at stake here and I'm really glad we have folks here participating in this. For our last barrier, uh, actually it was introduced right at the beginning, the whole uh, issue of the industry culture of masculine workplaces and how this can actually end up spilling over into the new energy industry as workers, as well as cultural norms can trans transition with them from the fossil fuel industry into the sustainable industry. To speak more to this, I invite our last Spark speaker, uh, Luisa De Silva. Thank you, Benu, uh, and thank you everybody for having me here. So I'm joining you from the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation today. And I'd just like to start by saying I'm not an expert in culture, and I can only speak to my own experience and the experiences of those that I know who have shared their experiences with me. So I'll start by saying that um, when I started my education, I started in engineering. And out of the class of 200 people, there was 15 women. We got to know each other pretty well. And uh, when I transferred over to science and then graduated as a geoscientist, it was about, about 40 to 60%. So there was a larger representation of women. I spent about 10 years in the energy sector. I did a lot of remote work and a lot of frontier culture work, uh, working in exploration and extractives industry, oil and gas mining and all of that. And I saw very few women in the field. And I always wondered why, but, um, if anybody has not worked in the field, uh, working in these kind of environments is not exactly the most hospitable place for women. Let's start with language. You know, something as simple as being in a, in a meeting and suddenly somebody brings up the term, the rule of thumb. Well, if you know the history of that, you know that that was used as uh, the thickness of a whipping stick, you know, for people that got out of line. Or calling your undershirt a wife beater, which, uh, you know, alludes to uh, violence towards women. It's very disempowering language. Um, something as simple as work boots. When I had to go buy work boots to work in the field, I couldn't find women's work boots. I had to choose between a man size four or a man size six, right? And neither one fit me. Um, so that's also quite disempowering. What, my first uh, job was in fossil fuels uh, and I worked in the Athabasca oil sands. I worked in a remote camp. There was 300 men and 20 women. So immediately you're outnumbered. And you have to be pretty thick skinned and resilient to be working in an environment like that, which is an extremely tall order for a woman who's coming out of her formative years. And like a lot of people here have mentioned, perhaps thinking about other things like their children. Um, you know, it, it creates an environment where uh, you're going to have a lot of decent guys in these environments, but you're probably going to have men that are not so particularly decent and perhaps not so enlightened to know that certain terminologies uh, become microaggressions and, and shouldn't be really used. Um, and even if, you know, 50% of, of the men in these kinds of places are, you know, uh, decent, there's still quite a large proportion of them that aren't. And this puts women on the back foot. Uh, this, you know, can create the kind of situation for harassment, uh, microaggressions, and these microaggressions cut into your confidence, makes you feel like you need to fight for every single inch um, that you have and to constantly be proving your right to be where you are. And men don't face that same fight, right? Because it, it is kind of a bit of that frontier culture. When you go into a smaller work environment, so I, I worked in smaller offices, any kind of little microaggressions like that were called out by the other men. So that made a huge difference. And we don't need, you know, saviors in that sense, but we do need that awareness that, hey, this is not okay. And it goes beyond policy. It actually has to be implemented. And I think it was uh, Deanna Burkhardt that said it really well just a few moments ago, uh, that is the culture is the worst behavior that is being willing to tolerate. And that's exactly right. You have a, a larger environment where you're working remotely and um, these things are not being uh, kept on tabs, you are going to have a worse culture. Um, so I think balancing men and women, that will definitely make the largest difference. Um, and you have this strength in numbers. You know, it's a very simple concept, but 
just increasing the number of women will already make a huge difference. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Luisa. So much to dive into. Um, the clock is ticking too fast for us on this one. Uh, I think uh, we might as well just roll up our sleeves and dive into our breakout sessions where we can reflect on what the speakers have said and look at what potential pathway forward could be for a sustainable and an equitable transformation. So maybe if I can get the globe behind the scenes team to open up the meeting rooms, people should start seeing messages on uh, which meeting room they have been assigned. You also have the ability to move from one meeting room to another if you haven't been assigned one. Um, yeah, let's get this started. And uh, I know a lot of people have a lot to say here, so let's dive in. All right, people are back in the room. I am so sorry, folks. I apologize. I have to cut off these really rich discussions. Fortunately, we can continue these conversations on the pathway forward at the next dialogue in our series. It's going to be happening in person at the Globe Forum 2022 in Vancouver. So I hope to see you there. If you'd like to know more about the work through the partnership between Pemina and Globe and other engagement opportunities, please take a look at our website. You'll find the link in the chat. Uh, I want to thank quickly all the sponsors and speakers for making today's session happen. Special thanks to the Globe and Pemina teams who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes. Um, and most of all, thank you to all of you for your engagement, your great questions and participation. We know the task in front of us is monumental, but as we saw in today's discussion, we have a ton of kick-ass women leaders working on this. So we look forward to working with all of you more. Thanks everyone and have a great day. Cheers.